Dan. I am from New York State. I'm from upstate New York, and I made two visits, one with my mother in the 1970s, and then again in the 1980s with my Russian class at Williams College. And so uh, it's wonderful to see uh, the Jordanville uh, thriving and to see that you have a, an, a, such a wonderful museum. Uh, I asked the director for a list of objects that you have that are connected with the reign of Catherine the Great. And I was, I was just thrilled to see uh, what a wonderful collection you have. And I'm going to be including some of the items from that collection in my talk today. So thank you so much. Uh, and as we get going, uh, some of you may be more familiar with Catherine the Great through the series on uh, Hulu, uh, The Great, uh, which had a second season this past year, or you may have been fortunate enough to see the four-part uh, series uh, starring Helen Mirren on, on the BBC. And uh, as you can tell from these two images, these are two very different series. Uh, and so one of the things that I'll be addressing today is how is it, how is it that Catherine remains so much a part of our popular culture today? Uh, how is it that we can have two very, very different views of Catherine the Great today? Uh, as you look at these images, uh, maybe you can guess which series is the more historically accurate and which is the more fanciful. Uh, in fact, it's uh, proud of being only occasionally true. Uh, and so I'm an expert on the memoirs, as, as Hannah explained, uh, and I feel the responsibility of uh, working with an important historical document. And so in my work as a literary historian, uh, this is going to be the story of the documents, uh, the story of the memoirs, of the biographies, uh, and of the stories that uh, we tell about Catherine, uh, stories that she, from the very beginning of her reign, uh, sought to shape for us. So we're part of Catherine's story in, in many ways. Uh, and one of the uh, pressing problems for Catherine uh, then as now uh, is the problem of the legitimacy of the Russian ruler, especially if that ruler is a woman. Uh, and so this is a talk that is as much about the 18th century as it is about today. So I thought you might be interested to see how what the memoirs actually look like. Uh, this is a photograph of the opening page of the last memoir. She wrote four memoirs. Uh, the first one she burned. Uh, we have uh, the other three memoirs. They were written 20 years apart. And we translated the last memoir that she wrote in the last decade of her life. And uh, one of the questions that we uh, wanted to answer in the archives, so here are the archives. I thought you would want to see uh, your, we're at a museum and uh, archives of course are a museum of books. And so this is the uh, Russian uh, state archive of ancient acts and it's where documents from before 1800 are kept. Uh, and so my husband and I spent uh, two weeks here uh, looking at the actual handwritten by Catherine uh, manuscripts of uh, her memoirs. And it was a, it's probably the most exciting project that the two of us uh, will ever be part of. Uh, and uh, it's a project that uh, is really part of a very long tradition of uh, uh, reading and thinking about uh, Catherine the Great's memoirs. And so uh, the memoirs are all different, it turns out. Uh, the first memoir she wrote before she became empress, uh, she wrote it for the uh, uh, British minister to Russia, the ambassador, Sir Charles Hanbury Williams. Uh, and it ends with one line, she gave birth to the heir to the throne. And that, of course, was going to be her uh, 
uh, security uh, as she was preparing for the succession struggles uh, with the death of Peter the Great's daughter, the Empress Elizabeth, uh, and uh, her husband was the heir, uh, but not everybody felt that he would be a good successor. And so uh, her second memoir she wrote in the, uh, six, in the 1770s uh, as she was at war in the first of her wars with uh, the Ottoman Empire. And she, had, uh, uh, she was also responding to European critiques of, of Russia and of her reign. Uh, and the third memoir was after the second and the uh, second Russia-Turkish War, and after the death of Pachumkin, uh, the man of all her men who she really loved and may have uh, secretly married, and who was her general and the architect of her southern strategy. And uh, after his death, she once more set out to write her memoirs for posterity. And those are the memoirs that have uh, come out uh, periodically in, in the 19th century and then again in the early 20th century. And uh, these are the memoirs that were a state secret for a number of reasons. Uh, first, because it's clear that her son was probably not her son by her husband, and that meant that the rest of the Romanov, uh, uh, Romanovs were illegitimate. Uh, and secondly, uh, because uh, it, it just presented uh, a less than wholesome image of the uh, monarchy, which was a, a central goal in the 19th century for the Russian monarchy. So here we see a few of the uh, ways that Catherine has been portrayed in the movies. There is the uh, European Catherine, there is the English Catherine, the, there is the American Catherine. Uh, before them all was uh, Sir uh, George Bernard Shaw, uh, great Catherine. Uh, so there were plays as well. There is a Russian Catherine. Today, there are also uh, exhibitions devoted to Catherine the Great because the uh, Russian government has been using the arts as part of its uh, soft power abroad. So uh, my husband and I try to go to uh, these exhibitions when possible. And uh, we noticed that there was a big difference between the 2006 exhibition in Montreal and the 2016 exhibition at the Hermitage in Amsterdam because the Hermitage in Amsterdam exhibition included a room devoted to Crimea. Uh, and I've also, for this talk, I've, I've in the light of uh, the events in Ukraine, uh, I have also worked up a slide for uh, several slides for us uh, about Crimea to try to understand uh, Catherine's historical role in what is today uh, a, a place of war uh, again. And so Catherine uh, remains a, uh, not only uh, a person who uh, created problems for the royal family because uh, her son was illegitimate uh, and she had a series, she had a series of lovers, favorites, uh, as, as all the rulers did, um, but hers uh, have become more famous. Um, but also because of the politics of her reign. And that really does get us closer to why she is known as the great. Uh, she was the uh, greatest conqueror of territory uh, since Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century. Uh, and you can see on this map uh, here, an arrow pointing at Crimea, but all of this territory was also conquered by Catherine. Uh, and you can see why Poland is very concerned uh, if uh, Putin is claiming that uh, Crimea historically belongs to Russia, while well, all of Poland also under the same uh, uh, timeline kind of also historically belongs to Russia. Uh, and Catherine's uh, work uh, together with Frederick the Great, uh, 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 King of Prussia, and Maria Theresa, uh, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, they 
divided Poland in partitions. You see the various colors, so in the Polish partitions, and they wiped Poland off the map. Uh, Catherine's uh, you know, policies in Poland couldn't be published during the Soviet period either uh, because of Poland's uh, role in uh, Eastern Europe for Russia. And so uh, some, of, some information from Catherine's reign is, has only come out in the last couple of decades uh, with the end of the Soviet Union, especially uh, uh, the, all, the, all the diplomatic letters in connection with the Polish partitions. These exhibitions on, on Catherine the Great sell a lot of books. So this gives this, you see our book, but you also see uh, various other books about Catherine the Great. Uh, she really is a, a cultural icon uh, that we're familiar with in a way that we don't think about Alexander the First, for example. And here is an example of uh, uh, most recently the recent biography by uh, Robert Massey, who is best known uh, for his uh, blockbuster, Nicholas and Alexandra. But also in Russia, the Russians are finally getting in on the Catherine Act because in the Soviet period, of course, uh, no, no historian wrote about the, the the czars uh, or uh, the, the life of royals. And so one of the things that I have realized in looking at how it is that we could have two very, very different views of Catherine today has to do with the documents. And it has to do with the kinds of biographies uh, that have been written about Catherine. And the fact it was true in the 18th century, and it was true until very recently that all of these biographies were written by foreigners. And so Russians only in the last few decades have begun to develop the uh, considerable uh, art of writing the biographies of founding fathers, founding mothers, uh, the genre that I think we take for granted, I don't think anyone is surprised if there's a new biography of George Washington or that Alexander Hamilton, uh, well, he has a musical that that is pretty uh, amazing, but uh, we're very familiar with the uh, founding father, we're very familiar with uh, British royal biographies, uh, but the Russians have yet to develop uh, the the considerable art that goes into writing uh, the, uh, this kind of biography. So I thought we might uh, back up a little bit and uh, look at the 18th century Romanov dynasty. And uh, you'll see right away that uh, it's quite distinctive. There are four women and there are four coups. Uh, and this presented a picture uh, to Europe of great instability. Uh, and uh, this was really, we, we think of the coup itself as somehow delegitimizing Catherine, but the real problem for Europeans was uh, what did this, uh, what did a coup pretend about the stability of the brain? And so, it's important to know that Peter the Great made a major change to how succession worked in Russia in the 18th century. He, in, in 1722, he changed the rules so that it was no longer the firstborn male and that the ruler could choose uh, his successor. He died without choosing his successor and so his successor was his wife. Um, the reason Peter made this change was that his son, uh, his son, his son had tried to had had escaped Russia, tried to escape Peter, uh, and Peter had him brought back by a uh, uh, an, a uh, a certain Count Tolstoy, uh, who would be uh, was the uh, great 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 uncle of uh, uh, the writer Leo Tolstoy. Uh, had him brought back to Russia where he was tortured to death. And so he didn't have a son uh, anymore. And so this was why he changed the rules. 
uh, the there was still the attempt to uh, have the firstborn son uh, reign, and this was complicated because uh, Peter the Great had a half brother, Ivan, and so the they had to consider the uh, inheritance from uh, both sides of the family, and so. Uh, but adding women into the mix made it even more complicated. And so uh, Catherine I came to the throne as Peter's uh, wife, uh, then uh, Peter II, the, uh, then we have Anna Ioannovna who comes from the other, uh, from uh, Peter's half-brother's side of the family and her son. Uh, and then we have Peter's daughter, and Peter's daughter, Elizabeth, has been in the running all along, and she comes to power in a coup, and Ivan VI ends up being thrown in uh, a dungeon, in a prison, and he, you can see from his dates here that he is killed in the first uh, couple of years of Catherine's reign, because there was an attempt to free him and the orders for the guards were that if anyone attempted to free him, that he would be killed. Uh, and when Elizabeth died, Catherine's uh, husband, Peter III, he was her, uh, Elizabeth had chosen Peter III. Uh, he was the son of her sister. He was her nephew. He, she had also chosen his wife for him, Catherine II. She was the uh, princess uh, from Stetten, a minor German principality, and she was chosen because she would, was in a, not in any position to cause much trouble, or at least that is what Elizabeth hoped. So this gives you this gives you an idea of uh, what the 18th century looked like, and I think it already puts uh, Catherine's coup in a different uh, different light. Uh, you'll see that she ruled for a good long time, for 34 years, uh, longer than uh, any of her predecessors in in that century. So what made Catherine great? Uh, well, we have a precedent. There is Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great became great after the Great Northern War. I think it's no, uh, it's no accident that uh, Putin has decided that uh, Peter the Great now is his hero uh, because of fighting the Great Northern War. Uh, he characterized, Putin characterizes this as returning Russian lands. Uh, but as we'll see, part of what Peter was, was about in, in this war really was uh, it, it, it placed Russia on the map because he, in conquering Sweden, he conquered the great uh, military mastermind, Charles, Charles XII. And uh, this made Peter a uh, European class uh, gen uh, uh, general as far as the Europeans were concerned. Uh, he had gone to Europe on an expedition to learn shipbuilding and early in his reign in 1699 and couldn't get a meeting with uh, uh, King Louis XIV. Uh, but when he went back to Europe after his victory at Poltava in the Great Northern War in uh, 1709, uh, he went back to Europe and he got a meeting with the new king of France, uh, uh, Louis the 15th. So Peter's various names, uh, uh, Peter the Great, father of the fatherland, but he also changed the title of the Russian ruler from czar, which emphasized the connections with uh, Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire to emperor, which created new connections with the Roman Empire and basically changed uh, the uh, kind of changed the, 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 the outlook of Russia, signaled that Russia was looking westwards uh, to, to Europe and less to Byzantium. Catherine received, was asked if she wanted these titles. Did she want to be uh, the, uh, the, mother, the mother of Russia? Uh, the mother of the fatherland she accepted in 1762, 
uh, and she was asked if she wanted to be uh, the great already in 1767, uh, but she turned down these titles and she said she would leave it up to posterity. So what does posterity think? Why was Catherine great? Uh, these are the reasons that I am going to talk about today. Uh, she was a writer. Uh, she was a prodigious writer. Uh, and through her writing, she not only shaped her legacy, but she shaped how Europe saw Russia. She, uh, she herself embodied uh, the new Enlightenment Russia. She was a legislator. She reorganized Russia in a way, in various ways that uh, uh, were uh, not changed until the Russian Revolution in 1917. She was an administrator. Uh, she was also a military general. So let's start with Catherine as a writer. Uh, this is one of my favorite images of Catherine, and we're going to be looking at a lot of images of Catherine because that was another way that she shaped uh, people's perceptions of her and of Russia. And here she is holding her great instruction. Uh, this was her instruction to her uh, legislative committee, which she convened uh, from 67 to 69. And it was to, re, uh, uh, to reshape the Russian code of laws. Uh, it was called off uh, because she's embarked on her first war with Turkey, uh, but it also produced the Nakaz. And the Nakaz, is, the Great Instruction, is actually a document that Jordan, Jordanville has a copy of this, the Russian History Museum, and I will show you some images. So it was originally in French. Uh, you see in this uh, in this enamel that uh, she has a bust of Peter the Great looking down on her. Uh, she has some books and we can tell that one of them is Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws. In fact, a study of her great instruction shows that she took most of it from uh, well-known European classics uh, about being a ruler in, and that this today, this would be plagiarism. Uh, but then it reassured everybody that she was part of the same conversation they were all having about what it meant to be a ruler. We also see that she's got the ermine lined cloak. She has her initial E here in her chair. Uh, there are the Roman columns. Uh, and here is her, uh, her orb and her scepter here. So everything speaks to her as a ruler. Catherine was a prodigious letter writer. She used writing letters to Europe as a way to uh, shape, you know, it was, uh, today it would be uh, the press, it's the press release, but uh, she was a writer. She wrote to the most famous set of correspondence was with the great French intellectual Voltaire, uh, but she wrote over 10,000 letters. And it's only in the last few years that uh, the scholar Kelsey Rubin Detlev has uh, been begun to kind of put together the story that these 10,000 letters tell. And it's, uh, they, are, they are delightful. Uh, they are a tour de force in uh, French, uh, German, and in Russian. She was trilingual. Uh, and so this is this is a project whose time has been uh, uh, it's, it's been long overdue and so it's very exciting to see that this is being done and so uh, you can in the Oxford World Classics series you can buy a, uh, a selection of those letters and and see see for yourself what kind of writer she was. Uh, she corresponded with uh, kings and queens. This is how she did her administration. She had a staff of uh, five secretaries. Uh, some of the, the more important letters she wrote in her own hand. Others uh, were written by her secretaries for her. So they are all part of what I call 
Catherine's literary offensive uh, to control the narrative about Russia in Europe. And by Europe, well, there's Berlin. Uh, the court of Berlin uh, was the head of the Prussian, uh, was head of Prussia. And then we have Paris, of course. So the writings in red are by her. Uh, the red line is before and after she becomes empress. And so you see that already in the first decade of her rule, there are books by uh, Roulier and Chape d'Autroche uh, that come out in France that are uh, critical of, Cap of Russia and Catherine's rule. But you also see Voltaire has a history of Peter the Great. And so Voltaire worked with the, uh, Catherine's predecessor, Peter the Great's daughter, the Empress Elizabeth, uh, to produce his history of Russia uh, under Peter the Great. And the French philosophes were very interested in Catherine. Voltaire corresponded with her because uh, they believed that a strong ruler could change uh, his or her country for the good. And so they placed a great deal of hope in Catherine. Uh, and so uh, this, this explains not just why Catherine was interested in them, but why they were so interested in Catherine. And so Russia, of course, had a long way to go. Uh, it was clear to everyone that Russia was a slave state. Uh, serfdom uh, accounted for, you know, through, through the end of the 19th century, uh, Russia was a country of about 75, 80% peasants. Uh, most of whom were serfs. Uh, and this was, you know, of course, and it, it's a huge population. It's over by the end of the 19th century, it's 50 million serfs. This is a, a enormous population when compared with the United States, which had 4 million slaves. Uh, it's, it's easy to see how you had a revolution in Russia with those kinds of numbers. So in the 18th century, uh, the French, obviously saw that Russia had a, a long way to go and Catherine uh, everywhere defended Russia and uh, to the extent that she made sure that Rulier's memoirs uh, were suppressed. Uh, he, he could read them aloud as salons, but he couldn't publish them until after her death. Uh, and Shop uh, she in fact wrote a rebuttal to anonymously. Uh, and what she called an antidote in 1770. At the same time, she's, uh, uh, her correspondence with Voltaire is at its greatest intensity. Uh, she's fighting a war against the Ottoman Empire. It is the uh, Russian Orthodox, the Christians against the Muslims. Uh, she's also writing her middle memoir. So uh, putting in place Another response to uh, some of the criticisms that Rulier and Chapdotrush had of Catherine, that she was a princess from a, mile, uh, 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 a minor German principality. And so she trotted out her youth, uh, spent in the splendors of the courts of uh, Brandenburg, uh, where her, uh, I think her godmother was, and also in uh, Berlin at the court of uh, Frederick the Great. In her final memoir, she, there is no childhood. Uh, she comes to Russia, she's there for the job. Uh, it is a memoir that is very much like uh, Plutarch's Parallel Lives, comparing the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, and she compares herself to her husband, uh, Peter the Third, and uh, you know her question. Just as her question was for Catherine, uh, who should it be? Who should be your successor, me or Peter, who was uh, poorly educated and and uh, not of not of completely sound mind, uh, or or me? And it's the same question that she leaves up to the readers. After Catherine's death. The books start coming out. Uh, you don't even need to read French to understand that this is the secret history of her principal lovers. Uh, 
uh, from 1798. She had died two years previously, 1796. Uh, Rulier is finally able to come out with his 1762 book. Uh, and uh, Catherine, of course, objected to whatever the French had to say about Russia because she, she said they, 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 they are here today, gone tomorrow. And they don't know Russian. You know, what, are they, what do they really understand about this very complicated country? There was a very interesting series of uh, biographies that came out in uh, France and uh, London that were in fact the same biography translated uh, with additions, retranslated. It's called the Castera Touk biography. Uh, Castera uh, took the French view of Catherine, which was that women shouldn't rule. Uh, and so uh, a great deal of interest in her sex life. And William Touk the Reverend William Took had been uh, stationed in St. Petersburg uh, for over two decades and added in a lot of Russian history. Uh, and then it was retranslated back into French and Castera added more to it. And then uh, uh, Took again uh, added more when it was retranslated into English. We also have a very important source for the 19th century, which was Masson's uh, memoirs, uh, Secret Memoirs of the Court of St. Petersburg from 1800. Then as the 19th century progresses, uh, we see uh, the, great, uh, the Russians are finally able to uh, publish more and more from Catherine's reign. And uh, Vasily Bilbasov wants, uh, tries to publish a history of Catherine II. Uh, the first volume comes out in Russia. He's forced to publish the second volume in Berlin in Russian because uh, Alexander III thinks it's too sensitive. Uh, and that's really, we only get in up to 1764, two years into Catherine's reign in this history. There is a Polish, uh, biography of Catherine and Le Roman, the, the, the affair of, of an empress, uh, the Polish views of, of the Russians, of course, uh, are, are none too, too kind, uh, given Catherine's uh, legacy of having helped uh, the uh, Frederick the Great and Maria Theresa take Poland off the map. Finally, in 1907, after the 1905 revolution in Russia, her remaining three memoirs are published in the Russian Academy edition uh, in French. And it's uh, the, the first memoir is translated into English in 1926 by Susan B. Anthony's daughter, the suffragette, uh, Catherine Anthony. The French produce another you know, sexy pot boiler, the favorites of Catherine the Great. And in the 50s, Catherine's middle and last memoirs are published in a French edition that basically kind of mushes together these memoirs that were written in very different circumstances over two decades apart. Uh, and this is what is translated into English. And so this is what we inherited when we set about translating Catherine's memoirs afresh for the first time. And we were also the first translators to go to the archives and look at the actual documents. There were a few more uh, additions uh, in French uh, on her passions and uh, in English, passion and luxury, uh, the English not to be outdone. But since 1981 in the West, there has been a phenomenal tradition of literary scholarship, a good deal of it uh, in Britain. Uh, Isabel de Madriaga's uh, magisterial Russia in the age of Catherine the Great has really uh, cha changed, changed everything about how we view Catherine. Uh, Isabel de Madriaga had all the languages. Uh, she was a Spaniard who was trained in, in Britain. And she, of course, had Russian, German, and French. Uh, and without those languages, you can't uh, really do serious work on Catherine. 
Uh, there have been uh, other biographies of, of Catherine and her life uh, and her reign uh, since then. And so this is now, uh, so here you can see the documents that give us the historical Catherine, the Helen Mirren portrayal of Catherine in the BBC series, uh, because we really do have a lot of good information. So now we're going to look at another way that Catherine carried on her public relations war. Uh, her, we have her letters, of course. Uh, there, uh, the art collections that she bought in Europe uh, showed the Europeans that Russia was serious about enlightenment, that Russia had the money. Uh, and there are the portraits of Catherine. So, before Catherine came to Russia, this is most likely the portrait of her that was sent to the Empress Elizabeth to seal the deal for her royal marriage uh, with one of the most uh, one of the most eligible matches in all of Europe. And uh, this is what's called a presentation portrait. Once Catherine is in Russia. Her name is changed. She becomes the Grand Duchess Yekaterina Alexeyevna, and she is given the Order of St. Catherine, which Peter the Great created uh, for his wife. It's a chivalric order. And you see her wearing the, the star of the order with the red sash. And this is uh, what, what goes along as a, as a lady in waiting. This is a portrait with her husband, the, the Grand Duke, and he is wearing the uh, Order of St. Andrew. This is the blue sash, and that, this is the highest order there is. It was the first order that Peter created uh, because when Peter went to Europe, he saw that everyone else had these sashes and the Russians didn't, and so he created them. Uh, so these were the two orders that he created. Here we see uh, Peter's daughter, Elizabeth, on horseback in her general's uniform, wearing the, sa the blue sash, the Order of St. Andrew. Here we see the Grand Duke on horseback. In, and here we see Catherine in her equestrian portrait. And, uh, so this was a style of portrait for rulers. And once Catherine becomes empress uh, in a coup, uh, her husband had managed to rule for six months. Uh, her husband was a German speaker. He had been brought from, uh, from, from Germany, from uh, Courland. His mother, the Duchess of Courland, was uh, uh, the Empress Elizabeth's sister. And so he idolized Frederick the Great. And part of Russia had just won the Seven Years' War against the Germans. And Peter began his reign by giving back the land they had won uh, by changing the green uniforms of the Russians to the blue, Prussian blue uniforms by preparing to launch another war when the coffers were bare. Uh, soldiers weren't being paid, and uh, Catherine feared for her life. And so, not surprisingly, uh, those around Catherine decided that uh, it was time for a coup. Uh, primarily, her, her favorite at the time was the uh, uh, Grigory Arlov, and he had uh, four brothers, and they were all uh, had important positions in the elite uh, guards units. Uh, in St. Petersburg, and so they sprang into action, and so there was a coup. So here I have for you an item, an amazing item in the Russian History Museum in Jordanville, uh, Coronation Medal. So Catherine on the front and on the back, uh, the date of her coronation, uh, September 22nd in 1762.
here are the orders that uh, Peter the Great created, the Order of St. Andrew and the Order of uh, St. Catherine. And they have uh, inscriptions, they have maxims, mottos. Uh, so for faith and loyalty, uh, for the blue ribbon, which goes with the ruler and with the most important ministers. And for women, the Order of St. Catherine for love and fatherland. So Catherine, in her initial portrait when she's in Russia, is wearing the Red Order of St. Catherine. Here she is again with the Red Order of St. Catherine. And once she becomes Empress, there she is on her horse Diamond, Diamant, Petersburg in the background. And she has that all-important ribbon that shows that uh, she is the ruler because if a woman is wearing the blue ribbon of the Order of St. Andrew, she is only she is the only woman who is wearing that and that means that she is the Empress. This is a very famous portrait of her. And she is also wearing the green uniform of the elite guards regiment, the Semyonovsky regiment. She changed the color of the Russian military uniforms back from the Prussian blue that her husband had chosen uh, uh, back to the green uh, of the traditional Russian. And uh, it shows, you can see, you can actually see the regiments in the background. How important was this portrait? Well, I was amazed uh, when I went to the Hermitage again in, 17, in uh, 2017 to see this portrait displayed with uh, two similar portraits uh, on each side. And this gives you a sense of uh, what Catherine, the effect that Catherine was aiming for. Uh, showing herself as a military ruler from the very beginning of her reign. What happened to her husband? Well, there's it's shrouded in mystery, but there is a letter that was sent by one of the Arluff brothers uh, asking Elizabeth for forgiveness for having killed Peter. And the Arluffs had every reason to kill Peter. Catherine's plan was to put him in prison alongside uh, poor Ivan VI. And in fact, Ivan VI's cell was, uh, uh, he, he, Ivan was being moved to another prison and uh, his cell would be used for Catherine's husband. Um, but uh, Catherine uh, was pregnant when Elizabeth died on Christmas day in 1761. And so uh, the coup waits for uh, until June uh, after she's given birth and she was pregnant with the daughter of, uh, with the son of Grigory Arloff. And the Arloff family thought that they could possibly uh, contract a royal marriage. Um, Catherine didn't do this, um, uh, but they had every reason to want Peter out of the way out of their way. There were many, many images of, of Catherine on horseback. So this is from the uh, famous Meissen porcelain factory in Germany. Uh, it was paired with a similar sculpture of the Empress Elizabeth. And again, uh, we see the all important blue ribbon and the green uh, uniform. This is a very famous uh, statue in St. Petersburg. It's called the Bronze Horseman. Uh, Catherine uh, ins had inscribed on it uh, to Peter I from Catherine II. And uh, it's an equestrian statue. Uh, Catherine had no claim to legitimacy other than that she had married into the family. And this statue laid her claim uh, in her gift to in her in her gift of tribute to Peter.
as I mentioned, after she comes to the throne, she puts together the legislative committee in order to uh, review Russia's code of laws, uh, which had been established by uh, Peter the Great's father in the middle of the 17th century. Catherine was unsuccessful uh, and the review of the laws wouldn't be completed until the reign of her grandson, Nicholas I in uh, 1832. Uh, but it yielded this extraordinary document, her instructions, uh, it's called the Nakaz, and uh, the Russian History Museum has this original copy from 1770, and you will see that it is in a number of different languages. It's not only in Russian, but also in Latin, and here you see in German and in French. And this document was Catherine's Enlightenment calling card to Europe. It was sent to all the European capitals. And uh, the after this is the this is the this is the introduction. And the next line on the next page, Catherine basically says what Russians have been saying ever since, and what Putin says also, which is Russia is a European nation. And this document showed in, well, in European languages that Russia belonged to Europe. And with all its quotations from, uh, from uh, leading scholars in the 18th century about uh, the nature of rule. Here is Catherine uh, as the legislatress in the temple of the goddess of justice. Uh, you see that she's wearing uh, the uh, blue sash and silver star of the Order of St. Andrew, and she has the red and black sash of the Order of St. Vladimir, which she created. And St. Vladimir is the order uh, for civil servants. So Russian nobles were forced to serve. Uh, in the 17th, 18th century, and then uh, it was made optional. Uh, Catherine uh, instituted laws for uh, the nobility, uh, uh, defining their privileges and their responsibilities. Uh, and she wanted to make sure that she had representatives from all of her uh, in, in all of the various uh, gubernias, these are the, this is the Russian equivalent of, of the state system that we have in this country. Uh, Russia was organized uh, according to its population uh, under Catherine and all of the gubernias acquired uh, towns. If they didn't already have towns, you see all the black dots. Uh, and this is how Catherine uh, tried to establish order in uh, her realm. And all of these towns were to be staffed by her nobles. And uh, Peter the Great had instituted a system called the Table of Ranks by which the nobility were all forced to serve for life. Uh, that term was shortened to 35 years, 25 years. And then uh, one really important thing that Peter the Third did, uh, when uh, in his six months was he listened to his nobles and he eliminated mandatory service. So it was optional, but all, all nobles served in order to gain rank uh, and rank came with various privileges and you served in either the civil service or the military. And Russia had the largest nobility in all of Europe uh, by the end of the 19th century, uh, there were three quarters of a million nobles. Uh, the, these are the, the, the three times as many nobles as the Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, many more than in uh, England. And uh, so uh, this was because they, the nobility staffed the empire. And it was a system that uh, Peter had started and Catherine uh, further codified, uh, and she created uh, two new chivalric orders, uh, the Order of St. George uh, for military service and St. Vladimir for administrative service. 
And you will see uh, Russians today wearing the orange and black ribbons of the Order of St. George uh, in connection with the um, uh, invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of, Cry of Crimea. Uh, this is where these colors come from. Uh, they were created by Catherine the Great. So in this portrait, uh, you see Catherine as the uh, uh, wearing uh, the Order of St. George. Uh, you see her uh, always, always an order of importance. So first the Order of St. Andrew is the top medal, and then we have the Order of St. George um, underneath. Now for some maps as we switch to Catherine as military general. Uh, this is from uh, our translation of Catherine the Great's memoirs. And you can see all the various states, the Polish partitions. I, I have several maps of, of this. So, uh, but here it's, it's quite clear, 1771, uh, then 1793, and then 1795. That all goes to Russia. To Prussia, 1772, 93, and 95, this section. And so here, uh, Aust and Austria takes uh, uh, these sections. These are the uh, results of treaties uh, ending each time the Russo-Turkish wars that Catherine is uh, participating in. This is a document from the, uh, from the Russian History Museum in Jordanville. Uh, you have a copy of the atlas from 1795, and it shows here, these are the Polish partitions, and it shows here uh, those lands as, as acquired by Russia. Here is how it happened uh, in uh, the various wars. So the third was in fact, a response to the Polish uprising of 1794 uh, and was the, the final end of the Polish empire. Uh, why Poland? Well, it turns out it's, it's hard to imagine, but uh, in, the, in the time of Ivan the Terrible, uh, in the 16th century, Poland was a great military power. And at, when Ivan died and then his, uh, Basically, uh, the original Rurik dynasty came to an end by the end of the 16th century, and you have the time of troubles and the installation of Boris uh, Godunov, and uh, it all ends in the beginning of the uh, 17th century with the election of Mikhail Romanov and the beginning of 300 years of the Romanov dynasty. In that period, the time of troubles, Poland invades and installs a, what's called a, a false Dmitri. And Pushkin wrote a famous play about it that Mussorgsky turned into an opera, um, Boris Godunov, that you may be familiar with. So this is another map of those uh, of the Polish partition. And you see that all of this land uh, that Catherine eventually takes in her wars with Turkey, uh, including the city of Odessa, which Catherine uh, is, is considered the founder of, uh, that this uh, is all from uh, territory taken from Turkey. So uh, the Russians may be claiming this territory today because Catherine claimed it, but in fact, uh, these are territories that have uh, belonged to various uh, empires at different points in history. Again, from your amazing collection, uh, a map of what is today Crimea. It was called the province of uh, Torid or Tav uh, Tavrid uh, in honor of uh, Prince Grigory Potemkin, who was Catherine's great military strategist, her, her great love, uh, possibly her, uh, her secret husband. Um, and so this is uh, by the end of the 18th century. Um, these are, this gives you a, a bit of a history of, 
of Crimea. Uh, Catherine uh, won it, uh, then annexed it, uh, breaking treaties to do it. Uh, and uh, it was a country occupied by Tatars, uh, Crimean Tatars. Uh, half that population left or was killed in the beginning of the uh, Soviet Union, and Stalin then deported a, a further quarter of a million. And in 1989, a quarter, uh, 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 one fourth of a million, so 250,000 Tatars returned. Uh, but the, this is the 1939 uh, Soviet census before the Tatars were deported, and you can see that uh, it was predominantly Tatar, uh, and it is now Russian, but not because it ever was traditionally Russian. <laughs> uh, it never was. Um, and uh, Stati the uh, polls show that before February of 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea, uh, only 41% wanted to join Russia. And that kind of does represent the historical legacy of Crimea. What did Catherine think of all of these peoples of Russia? Uh, it's important to remember that uh, since the 16th century, since the time of, of Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, uh, Russians have been a minority in their empire. It is only with the end of the Soviet empire in 1991 that Russians again became a majority in their country. Uh, how did Catherine think about these peoples? This is another wonderful uh, book from the Russian History Museum in Jordanville. Uh, it is a book that Catherine commissioned to show off all the different peoples of the uh, Russian Empire. She also had a project to collect the languages of all of these peoples. Uh, there's a letter to George Washington in which she asks him for uh, information about the languages of the American Indians. And uh, you can uh, she was very proud of the incredible ethnic linguistic diversity of her empire. This is another uh, medal from uh, the Russian History Museum collection, and it is on the uh, it is commemorating the occasion of the taking of the fortress of Ismail, which leads to the Treaty of Jassy and the taking of Crime, the annexation of Crimea uh, in 1791. So as you can see, Catherine annexed Crimea several times. Uh, this is another amazing uh, medal in your collection. I, I don't know much about it, uh, but it shows Catherine as the uh, war, God, Athena, the goddess of war. Uh, she's a warrior. She's a warrior goddess. But who, in fact, uh, got the job done for Catherine was uh, Prince Grigory Pachomkin. Uh, you see him here, well decorated. Uh, he was her favorite for all of two years, uh, but he remained the great love of her life, and uh, they had. Uh, uh, correspondence and a relationship that continued uh, to his death in 1791. And uh, at this point, Catherine has, you know, all the land that she's going to have. Uh, and it's all it's thanks to him. Uh, and um, this is a an extraordinary portrait that she had made of herself, which is in probably the, the greatest museum of uh, objects connected to Russia, Hillwood Museum in Washington, DC, which some of you may be familiar with. And I thought it would be good to show you some images from this museum so that if you happen to be in DC, uh, you can go visit. Uh, it was created by uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post of the Post Serial Fortune, but uh, it was her third husband uh, who was an ambassador to Russia in the early 30s uh, when the Soviets were uh, selling off 
the everything that uh, from the royal palaces in order to raise money for arms and for tractors. So this is an important portrait. Catherine in her full state regalia with the this extraordinary collar of the uh, uh, of her um, uh, of the Order of Saint Andrew. Uh, it was painted during the second Russo-Turkish War, and it was painted for her bankers. Uh, she had to borrow a lot of money, and so this was uh, uh, to thank them. Her favorite, one of her favorite portraits, uh, and there are many copies, this was painted not by a European, but by a Russian, uh, a, a surf artist, and uh, she's wearing all of her uh, medals, but she is in her traveling, what's called her traveling costume as she visited, it was her visit to Crimea. Uh, and this was for her to see what Potemkin had done, but also for her to be seen um, as the ruler. This is another uh, uh, Catherine dressed in traditional Russian dress, uh, wearing the kakoshnik, another way that Catherine wanted to be seen. She was, she was of course a German who is remembered mostly for uh, her French, uh, but she didn't want to be remembered as a German uh, because of uh, how her husband, Peter III, had, had used that uh, connection with Germany uh, in his disastrous rule. Again, not in, she's not in full battle dress here, but battles are never far from her, uh, uh, her presentation. She's pointing at the Chesme column, which commemorates Russia's victory in the Battle of Chesme in the first Russo-Turkish War. Uh, this is a painting by Borovikovsky. She looks like your grandmother. And here we come to the founding mother's biographies of Catherine uh, in Russian in the a uh, series of lives of remarkable people, the most important biography series in Russia. And you can see that Catherine has had a number of biographies and that in fact, the original biographies uh, from the uh, first uh, couple of decades of the post-Soviet period have now been replaced by biographies by Olga Yeliseyeva. And Olga Yeliseyeva, I discovered, has written a number of these biographies of important 18th century Russian figures, uh, Catherine Doshkova, uh, as well as Pachomkin. She wrote her dissertation on Pachomkin, uh, Peter III, and the, uh, the anti-slave uh, uh, writer Alexander Radishev. Uh, but Yeliseyeva is... A, is part of a much larger project. Uh, she's also writing the uh, life of Catherine uh, in novels, and uh, she is trying to create a, a, new, uh, a new kind of genre of the lives of Russian royals. And in these, the, one of the primary problems for Yeliseyeva is uh, Catherine, when she comes to Russia, she has to give up her Lutheran faith and convert to Russian Orthodoxy. And Western scholars have not paid much attention to this, but for the Russians, this is an important problem. And it turns out it was perhaps more of an issue for Catherine than we uh, have traditionally thought. Also, the problem of the murder of her husband uh, looms large in these biographies. And then also the question of Catherine and her favorites and uh, what kinds of relationships did she have with these men. So these are all uh, parts of the kind of, uh, uh, of the new narratives that the Russians are trying to figure out for Catherine. Uh, and uh, this is going to obviously uh, uh, change with time, but um, this is a, a very important uh, new way of writing about Russian history that we take for granted, but is uh, important for the Russians now to be discovering for themselves. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I've talked for an hour and I'm going to, uh, Hannah and I are going to uh, work on uh, answering your questions. So thank you so much.
wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Hilda, for a fantastic presentation. Um, we already have a few notes of praise from the audience. Elaine says that she has been to Russia three times, really loved the Catherine Palace, uh, and they visited a few churches. So you've brought back some wonderful memories for people, some new discoveries. I must admit, uh, one of my coworkers just purchased a book on Amazon. So um, we appreciate everything that you have discussed so far. I'll also note to all of our attendees that this presentation, again, will be recorded, posted to our YouTube channel. So if you've had to step out for a moment or you would like to get into the presentation again, you will be able to do so. Um, and we do have a few questions from the audience already here. Um, and because we're kind of on this topic of adaptation, let's begin with this one. Uh, Patricia would like to know, what are some of the other movies that you have looked into or done research on? Uh, she mentions one from Marlene Dietrich. Um, what are your thoughts on some of these other adaptations and potentially including the Hulu adaptation along with the Helen Mirren? So I'm going to bring up the images for these. Uh, so I feel that uh, the Helen Mirren adaptation is fantastic. And if you really want to understand kind of, the, it's really the best that I've seen ever. Uh, so that's the one to look at. Uh, what is the great <laughs> up to uh, by Tony McNamara? Uh, it's masquerading as feminism, but it's anything but uh, feminism as far as I'm concerned. And it's, uh, it's having a lot of fun. Uh, Tony McNamara adapted this from a screenplay, uh, from a play that he wrote uh, in Australia. Uh, and uh, in between, he made a very successful film about Queen Anne called The Favorite. And uh, it was a very quirky take on Queen Anne, Queen Anne who ruled all of seven years. You are more familiar with the Queen Anne style than you are with Queen Anne. But in Queen Anne's day, uh, when, uh, the, the important thing that happened in her seven year reign was that the United Kingdom was established. Uh, but at, she's a cipher and he can project anything he wants onto her, but that's not the case with Catherine. Uh, the historical record is very full, and so uh, for him to kind of uh, have this, it, it, to me, it was the Disney, Disneyfication of Catherine. It's her and her motley crew of, crew of you know, three like-minded people who want to change Russia for the better. Um, and what the memoirs make really clear is that uh, her life, she was, it was, she was, it was a political thriller. Was she going to, was she going to live uh, through the succession struggle? And uh, this is, Russia has a, a, a historical problem with succession struggles. What we're witnessing in Russia today is a succession struggle uh, of some kind. And um, so this is really the, the proper background uh, in which to see it. Also, the, the great, has uh, her husband, Peter III, you know, firmly in the saddle uh, and, uh, and the, Queen, the Empress Elizabeth is a crazy aunt in the background and um, that 20 years of rule, I'm, I'm sorry. So I, I, I have to think that the Australian Tony McNamara is, is as uncomfortable with female rule as the uh, Australian parliament shows, to, shows has shown itself to be uh, with all its scandals in the last few years. Um, and about the other films. Uh, so let's see, let's, here we go. Here are some of the other films. So what these films don't get right and what Helen Mirren does get right is that uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, the truth of palace life, uh, I think the best, best way for us to understand what palace life is like is to watch the amazing British series, The Crown. Uh, and uh, 
in these films for you know Elizabeth and Catherine to have a conversation as if you know Elizabeth is imparting wisdom to her about you know what it's like to be empress uh Catherine can't get any face time with Elizabeth this is what is so clear from the memoirs and uh there's a reason for that because Catherine uh is dangerous for Elizabeth and Elizabeth understands that because she was dangerous for the Empress Anna Ioannovna, uh, and she was banished and put on a tight leash and a tight budget. Uh, you know, in we can see, you know, a, a lot more in the royal family than uh, in England than we've seen in the past. And so those are very strange relationships. And so these films uh, normalize what in fact should be quite strange relationships because they are all uh, part of the power dynamics of the court. And the Helen Mirren series does a really good job of portraying that. Thank you. Now, next question here is a bit more on court life procedures, proceedings, and it's a question of clarification from Agnes. Uh, she would like to know why was Catherine not expected to be regent until Paul became of age, as opposed to being a Tsarina in her own right? So I think this question refers to the different possible scenarios. <laughs> so uh, the memoirs end with the ar arrest of the uh, chancellor, uh, Bistuja Frumin, with whom Catherine had been plotting uh, for her to become empress in her own right. So if Catherine instead is installed as regent for her son, then uh, whoever is behind her son, and that was uh, Nikita Panin and the Panin party, uh, they then have power. And so it's a different kind of power struggle. Uh, and so, you know, the other scenario, of course, was that Peter III rule and that Catherine stay in the background. But Peter III had a mistress. And his mistress was uh, a uh, Varansova. And Varansova was the sister of Princess Dashkova, who was at Catherine's, Catherine's side during the, during the coup. And they were both the daughters of um, Varansov, who was uh, one of the most important ministers under, under the Empress Elizabeth. And so his family was on both sides of this family, uh, both on Peter's side and on, on, on Catherine's side, so that they could make it through whichever side they were on. And so Peter, you know, basically, he had a mistress, and he, in, uh, as emperor, had the power to consign Catherine to a monastery or to kill her. And he, at a public dinner, said, I don't know where you've gotten your pregnancies from, uh, basically disavowing his children. And so Catherine and the Arloff brothers felt that uh, it was kill or be killed, and they got to work. And so during the coup, there are the two options, either Catherine rules in her own right, or she rules with her son at her side as, as regent. And she... Her, her first, she's, she's, she knows she has to have her son at her side, but she knows she, and the Arlofs know they have to proclaim her empress before the Panin party can proclaim her son emperor. And so it's all in the timing. Mm, thank you. Um, so we have another question from the audience member, Denise here, who writes, I was once told that immediately after the war for American independence, Catherine sent some Russian naval ships to protect certain US harbors from any potential return by the British Navy. Is there any truth in this story or is it myth and legend? I don't know. I don't know this story, um, but that doesn't mean I, I, I simply don't know it. Thank you. And there are quite a lot of Catherine stories kind of floating around here. Um, so let's go on to next inquiry here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, could you please spend a moment telling us a bit more about the Voltaire Library in St. Petersburg? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this was part of Catherine's cultural offensive to Europe. And she uh, basically uh, 
bought, bought the Voltaire Library. And the idea was that, uh, uh, and then uh, she also invited, she invited um, Rousseau to come and uh, not Rousseau, I think it was D'Alembert. So these are all the writers for the encyclopedia, the philosophes, uh, and in various ways she invited them and only one came, uh, Diderot, and uh, to actually visit. And he was, he was very disappointed with what he saw <laughs> uh, because remember the philosophes are interested in Catherine because they want her to uh basically turn the ship around as a as a strong ruler and and create an enlightened society and uh Catherine kind of floated the idea in her legislative committee uh commission to uh free the serfs but this was the, the serfs were the wealth on which her nobility depended and her 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 ability to stay in power depended on her nobility uh, and so she ushered in the, the uh, golden age of the nobility. <laughs> uh, she kept everyone close. Um, and so, uh, so Voltaire is part of, you know, this whole strategy of uh, making, uh, showing Europe that she's enlightened on the one hand um, and uh, play, playing to uh, their ideas that she could do more to enlighten Russia. Thank you. I was quite struck by the amount of letters that she wrote. Oh my goodness, I can't even imagine the amount of time spent there. Um, but we have an inquiry from Eleanor regarding paternity and testing. Um, Eleanor would like to know, would it be possible to have some sort of DNA test now using modern technology to see who the father of Paul was or if any attempts have been I don't know any. I don't know anything about that, but of course, of course, we'd like to know. <laughs> but the uh, but the common wisdom is, I, I mean, Paul had some kind of erectile dysfunction, and he had a surgery. He may have been circumcised, uh, and uh, but he never had any children. Uh, whereas Catherine had three children. Uh, two died, uh, and the last lived out his life as uh, uh, Alexei uh, Babrinsky, uh, and he died in around 1825. Thank you. Now, we actually have an anecdote from one of our audience members here, Christopher, who is a founder of the American Friends of Hermitage, who has been back and forth to Russia quite a bit. Uh, and he notes that he was told that Catherine bought the Orlov diamond for herself, but didn't want her subjects to know that she had spent that much. Uh, and therefore, Orlov had pretended to give the diamond to her. So another fascinating kind of Catherine tidbit to share with the audience. Um, but now to conclude with, I think, a final question here from the group. Um, were there any monarchs who did not recognize her authority as Tsarina? And what I will do, Hilda, to add on to this question, how have you seen this symbol of Catherine's authority being changed or challenged with your recent research and your translations of her memoirs? So she was Empress of Russia. She wasn't, she, so Zari, the, the title of Tsar was was retired uh, by by Peter. She was the empress, just as you have a Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, and no, there was there was no one who didn't recognize her authority. No. And uh, I, as I, you know, one of the things that I, the reasons I give these talks is because there's just so much interest in Catherine, and uh, there has. I think is your question whether uh, people are are casting doubt on her reign today in some way? Sure, maybe not so much reign, but just the symbol of authority and connection to, let's say, writing and being a ruler within her own right, as opposed to just kind of the romanticized view of Catherine and her lovers and that sort of, I'd say, dramatic intrigue. So. That is really the question I started with. And um, as a, it seems to me that these two different 
ways of thinking about Catherine have to do with the documents. We have uh, over a hundred years of writing, primarily coming out of France, uh, which has what is called Salic law. So it's uh, women are not allowed to rule. And so Catherine is see seen as illegitimate. Uh, the Castera Touque biography back and forth uh, between England and France. England, of course, has female rule. Uh, and so this is not an issue for the English in the way that it is for the French. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, biographers who are up to, up to the job uh, with all the languages, uh, beginning with Isabel de Madriaga. Uh, and uh, so we now have, you know, as I said, two very diverging portraits of Catherine in the Hulu series and the BBC series. Uh, and so uh, this is the, I, 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 it's a lot easier to talk about her lovers than it is to talk about her administrative reforms. Um, <laughs> and so people talk about what they know, but the fact is um, there's simply a lot of good history. There is a reason that she stayed in power for 34 years and that she left Russia in the administrative shape that it would have until the uh, Russian revolution. Um, and that's, she was a working empress. Uh, she did, you know, she was a, my, my, <laughs> if I sum her up in one word, she was a genius uh, in, in everything that she did. She was a genius and she doesn't disappoint. Um, she was, she was truly extraordinary. Um, and so, uh, if you are only thinking about Catherine in terms of her 12 favorites, so maybe you want to think of Alexander the first who uh, conquered Napoleon in terms of his nine favorites and 12 illegitimate children and his wife also uh, did have uh, a child, but not by him. Uh, you can think about that and, and, and not think about Napoleon in the war of 1812 uh, and somehow all the biographies by the French kind of got the got the word out. Uh, and um, I just think it's just kind of missing what is what is much stranger than anything we we imagine if we just focus on these lovers. And everybody right. had they all had favorites. I mean, that's what they were called. It was an official position. It's not a secret position. Uh, the families of the favorites benefit tremendously. There's a lot of pressure to get your to get your man in there <laughs> or your woman in there because uh, you get a lot of benefits um, and it makes your family wealthy. So these are all these are all official parts of being a favorite. And she didn't just choose whoever she was interested in uh, what the memoirs, the, mem the one of the reasons we wanted to look at the uh, drafts of the mem uh, at, at the manuscript was there is a dot, dot, dot section in the memoirs that was published by the Academy of Sciences in 1907, and they don't fill in those dots. And so we filled in those dots for the first time in French and in translation. And it's clear that Catherine, uh, when she had Paul I, when she had her first child, this was a dynastic problem because she and her husband had been married for eight years and had not consummated their relationship. And uh, Elizabeth, who had brought both of them to Russia, needed an heir. Uh, and so she gave each of them lovers to jumpstart them. And so the uh, Paul's, Paul, uh, uh, her husband Peter got the emperor uh, got the widow, let me see if I have the, yes, got the widow of George Grove. And she was given the choice of two initials, SS or LN. And so SS was Sergei Saltikov was the man that she chose. LN was Lev Narishkin. And these men were chosen for her by Elizabeth, not because they were cute, but because they were the scions of the two leading Russian noble families that had married in with the Tsar's family. So Peter's mother was a Narishkin and his half-brother Ivan's 
my, uh, wife was a Saltikov. And so that was how they resolved the dynastic crisis. So whoever, whoever her son Paul's father is, uh, his lineage is you know, as good as, as his father's lineage would have been. Uh, Catherine was also, her, her second lover was uh, Count Poniatowski, who came from the leading Polish royal family and she installed him later as King of Poland. Uh, Grigory Arlov, while well, he was from one of the leading no, noble families, so each of these, you know, this is this is how this is how the favorites worked, um, and 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 the that story is more interesting than you know she was a voracious lover story. All right, so I think that this is where we will conclude. Uh, thank you to all of our audience members for joining us. And thank you again for a fascinating presentation.